This week, is agriculture in need of another revolution? The big thing in agriculture is everyone's saying, well, what can we do to, to get farmers to voluntarily contribute to carbon sequestration. Big Ag gets a bad rep when it comes to sustainability, but with the help of new technologies, can it clean up its act? Today, uh, we estimate that approximately one in nine people in the world experience what we would call food insecurity. Higher prices and lower accessibility have forced millions into food poverty. Why greater supply doesn't always mean fewer empty bellies. Everyone says, how do we fight climate change? Well, we plant trees. And so we're basically planting a rainforest under the sea. How one of the world's fastest growing plants could provide an alternative to traditional agriculture, as well as a climate solution. I'm Kaylee Lines, and this is Bloomberg Green. First up, let's get your roundup of climate news with Jennifer Zabazaja. This is Bloomberg Green. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja in New York with your Green Brief. That ruthless heat wave across the U.S. Northwest has triggered rolling blackouts this week. According to Power Outage U.S., it affected more than 30,000 customers across Washington and Oregon. The temperatures are threatening to blow transformers and strain power lines. Airline industry group IATA says it will ask carriers to go net zero by 2050. It comes as pressure builds on the sector over its continued use of fossil fuels. Some big airlines have already made commitments, but the group hasn't updated its own goal in over a decade. The world's biggest carbon market is set to get stronger with the EU planning tougher limits on emitters. The changes are part of a package to transform every sector of the economy. A draft plan shows the price of polluting in the block could rise more than 50% by the end of the decade. And Lego thinks it may have found the building blocks to become more sustainable. It's unveiled a new prototype brick made from recycled plastic. The toy company has set aside about $400 million to go green. And that's your green brief. Kaylee? Thanks, Jen. Farming and food production is one of the most polluting industries on the planet, with some estimates finding it responsible for as much as 40 percent of annual global emissions. The gases are released from livestock, soils and the exhaust pipes of farm vehicles, all of which are key battlegrounds in the race to make farming green. With the need to feed more and more people comes the necessary economies of scale. The average farm in the USA has grown in size from just over 200 acres in 1950 to around 450 acres in 2019. If the birth of big ag was a necessity, is it inevitable that it is superseded by something else? Joining us now to discuss is Agnieszka D'Souza, our food and agriculture reporter in London. Aggie, what changes does agriculture have to make to get better for the climate? many, many changes. In a way, agriculture is both the victim and the perpetrator of climate change. So not only does it have to adapt to the changing weather, it also has to make radical changes in the way it produces, it delivers food. You know, it's a major source of carbon emissions, but it's also polluting to soil, water, because of the use of conventional inputs such as fertilizers, pesticides, and so on. So in a way, all of that has to be overhauled or tweaked and addressed. And, um, you know, we, ha we already have new technologies emerging, new farming techniques. You know, we were hearing more and more about uh, regenerative agriculture that is um, really focusing on the health of the soil and addressing that aspect. Uh, so there are many ways to, to get this done. We just have to kind of push forward with it. It's one thing to make agriculture more sustainable. It's another thing to then scale it. How big of a problem is that? Yes, indeed. Um, scalability, like with many other climate solutions, is the key. You know, can we scale it? And what is crucial for farming, really, as well, is how do you incentivize farmers to actually switch to other techniques? to implement those technologies and new methods. How do you create markets, incentives, investment in order to do it? So I think overall, all those questions lead to how we achieve scalability. And that is why, in a way, if you can recruit 
um, big companies and the big ag to actually do it and to help with it because of their vast distribution network, because of their vast influence, that could certainly help. The UN Food Systems Summit is coming up later this year. These are obviously questions that are going to come up there. Is Big Ag going to be responsive to some of these new ideas, and are they already taking steps in that direction? Uh, indeed, the UN, the UN is holding a major food systems conference less, later this year, and it's trying to bring all, all types of stakeholders to the table. Uh, you know, main questions being asked uh, will be how do we produce food that is good both for the health of people and the health of the planet. And it is trying to include different types of stakeholders, so businesses included. At the end of the day, the question is, um, you know, will the summit result in any visible pledges and commitments? I think that what big ag and big business and governments and so on will do will depend whether there actually are going to be any strong commitments. And I think in a sense we need that similar to uh, what has been achieved during climate summits. All right. Thanks so much to our food and agriculture reporter Agnieszka D'Souza in London. Coming up, in the U.S., despite having more wealth than average, farmers are given billions in government funding every year. But that money has few strings attached, missing the chance to incentivize more sustainable farming. We speak to a former chief economist of the USDA. This is Bloomberg Green. From Bloomberg's headquarters in New York, I'm Kaylee Lines, and this is Bloomberg Green. Data shows U.S. farming households have more wealth than average, thanks to the significant capital value of their assets. Despite this, farmers received $28 billion in two years from the Trump administration in the form of disaster relief and trade war bailouts. Economists now say this was a missed opportunity to push American farming to go green. We spoke with Joe Glauber, senior research fellow at the International Food Policy Institute in Washington, about big agriculture in the U.S. He was previously the chief economist for the USDA for six years, starting in 2008. The U.S. is a major food exporter. They're a major uh, food supplier to the world. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, agriculture, together with forestry, accounts for about 25% of global greenhouse gases. For the U.S., I believe it's more closer to 10% for agriculture, but that's not to say that agriculture isn't a big emitter. Certainly the big sources are methane. And methane essentially means animal production, although rice paddies generate methane. But animal agriculture is really the big one. Agriculture has essentially been outside of the direct conversation on regulation. Even if you were to go back to 2009, 2010, when Congress was considering regulating greenhouse gas, there were no proposals to directly regulate them like you would say for a carbon tax or something like that. The big thing in agriculture is everyone's saying, well, what can we do to, to get farmers to voluntarily contribute to carbon sequestration? And of course, that's essentially subsidies. Agriculture is one of the most subsidized industries in the United States. They were paid about $28 billion for the trade war with China. They received another $23, $24 billion for COVID. By September, for the most part, prices were above what they had been prior to the coronavirus. Yet there was, they were still putting in the second tranche of coronavirus payments, the third tranche. And now Secretary Vilsack announced you know, another tranche of payments for them. This was on top of standing safety net programs that provide them support when prices fall. You could make a much better case for those programs if you could tie environmental benefits to them. Agricultural payments are mainly tied to production or historical production, so it benefits large landowners. Who are we talking about when we talk about a farm? If you talk about the, the people who produce the stuff that is humans consume or animals consume, it's grown on farms, it's like 15% of the farms. So roughly 250 to 300,000 produce 85 to 90% of what's produced in this country. Generally, if you look at the median household income, it's far above the median household income of the rest of the population. But while the agricultural industry was getting aid from the USDA, another program it administers was being cut, SNAP. 
you have this disparity we've seen in the last two or three years, the rates of malnourishment, undernourishment have, have increased at the same time where we have rates of obesity increasing. In spinning this web of subsidies and incentives, the true whack-a-mole nature of regulation is confronted. Unless you really get a, a, a big shift in diets, people are still going to want to have beef. The U.S. is a huge livestock producer, obviously, but we're also pretty efficient for every pound of meat that's produced. We have a, a relatively low level of greenhouse gases compared to other livestock producing systems. Some will point out that if you were to do things like try to curtail that production in the U.S., you actually could shift production to other areas where you actually may get more greenhouse gases. Livestock farming makes up almost 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions, and a significant part of that is burped straight out of the mouths of cows. Bottling these burps could be a big win in the fight to cut emissions from a notoriously tricky industry. Luckily, one startup is tackling the problem with a novel innovation in bovine fashion, cow masks. Agricultural food giant Cargill plans to start selling wearable devices designed to curb methane emissions from cattle. The, the wearables that look kind of like masks uh, have been designed and developed by a UK startup called Zelp. Livestock farming uh, accounts for a substantial share of agricultural emissions. In fact, it actually makes up 14.5% of greenhouse gas emissions globally. And that's mainly because cattle, uh, sheep or other ruminants uh, release methane, basically a result of their peculiar, uh, unique uh, digestive systems. Most of that methane goes out through cow's mouths uh, as they burp. <coughs> Zelp's wearables get placed just above cow's mouths. Essentially, a set of fans uh, powered by batteries will suck up the burps and trap them in the chamber with a methane-absorbing filter. And once that filter is saturated, a chemical reaction turns the methane into carbon dioxide, which is then released in the air. It's still a greenhouse gas, but methane is much worse. So converting it into CO2 is still a win. The devices are not the only solution out there. In fact, there is a quest to find uh, the most effective way um, to curb methane emissions. Feed supplements or additives are being uh, tested and developed right now. More work needs to be done in order to gauge how effective these solutions are and scientists are looking into it. Uh, we know that most of these solutions cannot fully eliminate methane emissions from cattle. Farmers do need financial incentives in order to use them. Perhaps one of the ways uh, to help farmers would be to give them an opportunity to offer this climate smart milk or meat at a premium to standard products. Meat production and dairy production are still um, expected to grow in the next years. And that's largely because consumption is growing in, in many markets, uh, especially in emerging markets. So we, wa we won't eliminate cattle overnight. The production will be ongoing. So it's so important to actually find solutions that will address livestock's footprint. Dairy and meat companies, many food producers are under pressure from their investors and also consumers to reduce their carbon footprint. Coming up, farming the sea. How one company is growing kelp as a sustainable alternative foodstock. This is Bloomberg Green. From Bloomberg's headquarters in New York, I'm Kaylee Lines, and this is Bloomberg Green. The basics of farming haven't changed much since humans started tilling fields. You need seeds, water, and most of all, land. 
But since most of our planet is water, farming the sea could provide a much needed boost to global food stocks. Akua is a company attempting to do just that, producing kelp-based food that requires no inputs of land, fresh water, or fertilizer, and that sucks in carbon as it grows. Our Janet Wu went to investigate the Maine-based company fighting climate change through ocean farming. What is this? What are we looking at here? Yeah, so this is actually, um, this is a kelp farm. We're 10 acres, which is, it's a lot of, a lot of area for the bay. And there's a lot going on under the surface that you can't see. She's farming one of the fastest growing plants on earth. What began as microscopic seeds in November, just seven months later. These kelp lines are, you know, average, I'd say three feet long and still growing. It's getting bigger every day. Colleen was still lobstering when she met Tolif Olson, the man who built the first kelp farm in America. I kind of looked at him then. This is, like I said, like 15 years ago. It's like, Tolif, I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know if this is going to go. And once, I, once we got into the process and built those first farms and I saw, you know, what, what his vision was, I was like, you know, there is something here. The very first kelp farm in the United States was right there here in Casco Bay, Maine. Now there are more than 100 farms in Maine alone. The industry is growing as fast as the kelp. The global commercial seaweed market is projected to surpass $85 billion by 2026. Right now, 98% of the seaweed you buy in stores comes from Asia, where seaweed aquaculture dates back 1,700 years. Kelp farming is amazing. It requires no fresh water, no fertilizers, no feed. And at the same time that it's growing, it's just sucking up nutrients from the water. It's also cleaning the water. It's sucking up carbon. It photosynthesizes like a land plant, but apparently it's like 20 times more efficient. This stuff is amazing. And then you end up with this, this superfood. So this is it. Oh my gosh, it's heavy. It is heavy. Wow. Yeah. A superfood, but not something many people want to eat like this. Mm, this is really delicious. That's where Akua comes in. The key vitamins and minerals you're going to find in kelp are A and K. From a mineral standpoint, calcium, potassium, magnesium, uh, zinc, some omega-3s. Courtney Boyd Myers and her partner launched Akua four years ago with the multiple goals of building a sustainable business, fighting climate change, and creating new foods. So much of our soil today is depleted of vitamins and minerals because of the way that we're, you know, monocropping, and the oceans are still rich in it. So, you know, we're sucking that in with the kelp, um, putting it into a burger, and, and you're eating it. The patty is made with mushrooms, pea protein, black beans, chickpea flour, and extra virgin olive oil. But the main ingredient is kelp. It's not meant to mimic meat, but offer a satisfying alternative with a rich umami flavor. To date, we've secretly sold over 20,000 kelp burgers, and it's our goal to have a $100,000 month this July. During the pandemic, Akua raised a million dollars through crowdfunding. Good girl. This season, it will buy out Colleen's entire 30,000 pound crop. I've always wanted to come back to aquaculture because of its sustainability. And after seeing years ago what, you know, what the potential was for kelp and the ways it really positively impacts the environment, that makes me feel like it's a good business to start. Some of it's absolutely beautiful, look at that. Our company's goal is for every $5 million in revenue that we're earning, we're pulling 1 million pounds of harmful carbon out of the sea via the kelp that we're using. You know, everyone says, how do we fight climate change? Well, we plant trees. And so we're basically planting a rainforest under the sea. A hidden rainforest quietly cleaning the ocean while growing into the base of healthy new foods. Agriculture's carbon footprint is far from its only issue. 
Despite producing enough food to feed 10 billion people, much of the world's population continues to go hungry. This has only been worsened by the pandemic, during which prices have skyrocketed and access has decreased, leaving millions struggling to get food. Add to that rampant food waste, where roughly one third of the total production is lost every year, and big agriculture is crying out for a green revolution. Let's bring in Jessica Eyes, visiting professor of social and environmental challenges at the University of Texas, San Antonio. Professor, let's just frame this problem first. In many rich countries, we don't have to worry about food supply or shortages. That is definitely not the case everywhere. How many people in the world are hungry? Today, uh, we estimate that approximately one in nine people in the world experience what we would call food insecurity. So there's a difference between acute malnutrition and food insecurity. So food insecurity would be where you just don't have the confidence that you can get the food that you need every day to um, have the health that you need. And acute malnutrition would be what we consider to be people starving actively. How does climate change factor into this? Can you give me some specific examples about how changing climate affects food supply? So agriculture is actually one of the industries that is most impacted by climate change. Because when you think about it, our crops are heavily dependent upon the climate. So they require particular conditions for the food to grow. For instance, they need particular temperatures, they need particular precipitation levels. And what we know about climate change is it impacts the average temperatures in particular regions, but it also impacts what we would call incidents of extreme weather. So certain regions of the world might be experiencing drought, whereas others might be experiencing increased temperatures and increased rainfall. And that means that each farmer in that region with their particular crop needs to come up with unique adaptation strategies. And for some farmers, that even means that you don't grow the crop that you used to historically grow in that area. But aside from switching the crop that you are farming, are there different methods to farming that can create some kind of adaptation? So there are different methods and people are experimenting with a lot of these right now. And this is an area where we need to focus a lot of innovation and attention in the future so we can ensure that we don't have massive food shortages. So some of these examples that we could look at are um, genetically modified organisms. Um, so people are modifying um, certain crops to be more resilient against drought. So for instance, if there's areas in the world that are experience, that is experiencing drought on a regular basis, now they might modify the seed to be slightly more resilient against that shortage um, so that we can grow better. Um, we're also looking at precision farming. So using technology to understand what part of the field might need more fertilizer or less fertilizer or what might need more water or less water. And in this way, we can actually be more sustainable too in using precision agriculture techniques because we would only apply uh, fertilizer or we would only water in areas in the field that really need it and we could spare the areas that don't need it. How difficult is it to scale some of those innovations and new techniques? Right, I think you hit the nail on the head because one of the greatest challenges with technology at the beginning is making it scalable because it can be quite expensive. So when you talk about big agriculture, I think you're talking about the larger farms in more industrialized or wealthier countries. Um, so in those cases, these might be early adopters of these technologies. But in a lot of places in the world, um, a lot of farmers are still smallholder farmers. And a lot of those smallholder farmers we rely on for a lot of our food. And in those cases, these technologies are too expensive. They're inaccessible to them. Um, so expense is a big challenge at the beginning when it comes to making technology scalable. But a second one is making these technologies actually appropriate to the realities of the farmers themselves. Thanks to Jessica Eyes, visiting professor of social and environmental challenges at the University of Texas, San Antonio. That's it for this week's edition, but keep the conversation going. Follow us on Twitter, at Climate. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York, and this is Bloomberg Green.